All right, good morning, everybody. Um, we are here to start a nutrition webcast um, this week, and my name is Caitlin, uh, and this is my friend Emily. Hi, I'm Emily, and I'm here to join Caitlin to teach you about nutrition digestion. Emily and I are veterinary students, and we're going to be discussing the importance of nutrition, both for people and animals throughout the lifetime, and the use of simulated veterinary case studies to give real-world application. Uh, so basically what we're going to be doing is presenting you guys with this information in the form of a case study, which is a lot like how we do it within the veterinary school, and I know medical schools do a lot of the same thing. Uh, and so that'll be really interesting, and it would be a, a cool break for your students to actually look at the medical side of food and digestion. Uh, and we'll also teach a digestion game that demonstrates what happens when digestion works properly and then um, when it functions incorrectly as well. So that's a really fun game that you can play with students. It gets everybody up and laughing. And we're also actually going to demonstrate uh, how to make a protein model, which is about I think maybe a third of the way through our presentation. And so <coughs> Emily is going to introduce y'all to Max and what his case looks like. Okay, so Max is a six-month-old intact male Labrador Retriever. Um, <clears throat> that's a picture of Max right there on the on the right side of your screen. And then the chief complaint, which is just um, what the owner brought the dog in initially for, and it's going to be because he was vomiting and he had diarrhea. So the doctor is going to perform a physical exam, and they find that little Max is lethargic and tired. He has dysentery, which is just bloody diarrhea, and he's dehydrated, and that makes a lot of sense because he's having a lot of diarrhea. And then the history of the present illness is just when the, you know, when the doctor asks you, like, how long has it lasted, what color is it? Um, and the goal here is um, that the doctor wants to be able to draw a picture in their mind of what the sickness looks like. And if it's diarrhea or if it's vomit, then that's kind of disgusting, a disgusting thing to think about, but that's the, that's the goal. And so here we have, he started having diarrhea yesterday morning and hasn't stopped, and he's going about six times daily. Uh, the diarrhea appears mucoid and bloody, which just means that it looks like mucus. Um, sorry, that's kind of a little disgusting. Uh, he is potty trained, but he's pooping in the house anyways. So that's a big sign that maybe Max can't necessarily handle it or control the diarrhea. Uh, he began vomiting a few hours after the first diarrhea was spotted. The vomit is clear like water. He has not been interested in playing with his toys, even his favorite stuffed bunny. He has stopped drinking or eating. He is the only pet in the house, and he's an inside-outside dog. So all of these, um, <clears throat> all of these facts about Max are going to help the, the veterinarian or, or our uh, students to diagnose him in the end, and we'll make sure that a lot of these are hit upon when we go through the presentation, so that in the end they can figure out where the problem is, maybe what's going on. Okay, so uh, the first thing we're going to start with is nutrition. I think that that's um, going to help us gain a good basis for understanding what's happening, um, and then we'll talk about digestion and how uh, what the actual anatomy and how things are being broken down. So to start off, nutrition begins, I always like to ask the students, when do you think nutrition, good nutrition begins? And they all, you know, oh, it could be like two or five. And, but the reality is that good uh, nutrition begins during pregnancy and uh, mainly the first years of life. And so I always like to make a joke, well, you know, you can blame your mom for your poor nutrition because she ha started when she was pregnant. And um, this damage cannot be remedied once the child has aged. So uh, the, the damage done during pregnancy or the first two years of life uh, will maintain will be maintained the rest of the uh, child's life. So a good full balanced diet would include proteins, which are our uh, materials for growth and repair, carbohydrates, which are our sources of energy, our fats, uh, which also are energy, but they also contain vitamins that are vital. Uh, and then we have vitamins, uh, which are needed for enzyme systems, minerals for healthy teeth, bones, muscles, and fiber, um, and I always like to ask, does everyone know what fiber does? And they always like, oh, fiber helps you poop. And you're like, yep, that's good. That's a good way to think about it. So fiber helps you poop. So let's talk a little bit about protein chemistry. Uh, proteins are large molecules made up of combinations of amino acids. So at this point, uh, you're really going to transition your kids into talking about chemistry on a molecular level. Um, amino acids are organic substances made of nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, and carbon. Uh, and some proteins additionally contain sulfur or iron. Proteins such as uh, hemoglobin in our blood, which contains iron, gives it that red color. Um, 
And proteins are 3D structures, so once everything is folded and put together, they are 3D. And folding is dependent on amino acids present in the environment and, the, and where the protein is. Folding may also depend on a protease, which is just an enzyme that cuts the protein or a ligand binding to the protein, so the ligand would be an additional mo molecule. And so I'd like to talk about right here. So here we're going to start talking about folding. Um, so there is primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary protein structures. And you can see on the slide just a little bit of those explained. Um, your primary structure is just going to simply be that sequence and chain of those amino acids. And secondary is whenever it forms into either an alpha helix or a beta sheet, um, which are just different, the two different forms that those amino acids can fold into. Now would be a good time to ask people or your students if they know examples of a beta sheet or an alpha helix, a very famous alpha helix being DNA. Uh, and so that would be a fun little fact to give to them. And then tertiary protein structure is once you get three dimensional, uh, once everything starts folding and a protein um, interacts with itself due to side chain interactions. And then quaternary protein structure is when that protein uh, interacts with other subunits or other proteins based on those amino acid chains. And so we have a quick little activity for y'all that you can practice with your students, kind of just to explain and hit home what these proteins are. And luckily, all you need are pipe cleaners and beads, which a lot of teachers, uh, my mom's a teacher, and so I know this, a lot of teachers have these sitting around the classroom or at home or something, and they're kind of just looking for ways to get rid of them anyway. Um, so we have these pipe cleaners and the beads, and basically uh, each dot represents an amino acid on this um, bead. And then so the bead represents your primary, uh, your primary structure. And so you can also get different colored beads if you want to buy the multicolored bead bag, and each different color can be a different type of amino acid, and they can layer them on to the pipe cleaner in different orders and then to see the different proteins come from the different combinations of amino acids. Exactly. And so all you're going to have them do is take these beads that are either different colors or speckled with different colors, whatever it may be, and just add them on to this pipe cleaner. And so in the end, you'll have a pipe cleaner covered in beads and they'll um, be able to fold that into a different structure and maybe even this one it looks like was supposed to be a circle um, flip it on itself to give it that tertiary structure and then you could have them uh, go into groups and somehow combine these structures to make their quaternary structure uh, that way you can explain the difference between the primary secondary tertiary and even quaternary structures and proteins Another really fun game with the pipe cleaners <coughs> that are proteins is to draw a shape on the board uh, and then ask them to form a protein that's folded in a way that will fit uh, that shape. And so you'll actually get a lot of different combinations of different shapes. You'll get a full circle, you make it like a, a half circle that kind of wraps around it. And um, you can decide, or maybe you make one that's wrong. So you can say, hey, look at this protein. It's a different combination of amino acids and so it doesn't fit this shape because it has a different function. Um, and then, but this, this particular one fits the circle on the board, and so thus, uh, this protein would work in conjunction with this shape, and that's what it, it would perform its function that way. And so that can help relate um, the protein structure to protein function. And um, that's big in, pro in understanding what proteins do. of how protein folding is important in protein function is mad-cow disease. Most kids have heard about this and most adults have heard about this. Um, but the real name of mad-cow disease is bovine spongiform encephalopathy or BSE. And this is a prion disease. Prion disease is actually a protein disease. And this is caused by misfolding of a necessary protein that's made in the nervous system. Um, which means that this can you can get mad-cow disease either randomly through mutation and, and or by eating an already misfolded protein, like contaminated food. Um, we don't call it mad cow disease when you acquire it naturally by mutation, but we do call it uh, mad cow disease when you get it from eating contaminated beef. So I like to say uh, a, bad, a bad influence persuades the good kids in the class to also be bad. Um, and so the bad kid can either move in from far away or the bad kid can develop randomly from a good kid that's already in the classroom. 
And so that's my way of explaining that the protein can be eaten or the protein can be developed in the brain. And it also is a really good explanation for the fact that once you do um, consume that protein or that protein you, is a mutant and misfolds there, um, once it is misfolded, it in some, some way that is still being uh, researched, basically convinces other proteins to misfold as well, which is how you get such severe forms of that disease. And so um, economically, this is a big deal because the BSC in the United Kingdom peaked in January 1993 at almost 1,000 new cases per week. Cumulatively, uh, through the end of 2010, more than 184,000 cases of BSC have been confirmed uh, within the UK alone uh, in more than 35,000 herds. So economically, that, that really shut down um, the United Kingdom's beef industry because then uh, different countries won't trade with them for beef um, and fear they may, they may consume a BSC protein. Yeah. So other crown diseases that are present um, within the animal industry are scrapies, which is in sheep, uh, Crutchfield's Jacobs disease, which is in humans, that's the naturally acquired one, a form of mad cow disease. Uh, Kuru is also in humans, and then chronic wasting disease is in uh, deer, elk, et cetera. Uh, and chronic wasting disease is a, is a big topic today in um, the deer industry um, and raising deer. So Texas is the number one, one of the number one states in raising captive deer, and so chronic wasting disease has become a, a hot topic for um, this state particularly. And so this is a really good demonstration of the actual misfolding and how it continues and progresses. And so uh, the purple protein is the normal protein, and the dark blue is the mutated or acquired bad protein. And you can see that as they interact with one another, um, it starts convincing, sorry, it starts convincing all of the other proteins that are good around it to also misfold and be straight. And then slowly but surely, you'll see that it keeps convincing the good proteins to also be bad until you have this big clump of bad proteins. And that clump, of it, they actually start sticking together. And it's that clump that causes all of the issues in the brain. So for the nutrition side of proteins, let's talk about where you can find protein um, in, in food, and you can ask your students what they think, um, and it is, it's pretty simple. It's in meat, typically, meat and legumes. So if you go down this list, you can see that a beef sirloin has 68.8 grams of protein per every cup, uh, which is pretty significant. Chicken breast is next at 43.3, and then you can go down uh, and look further down at things like spinach and see that you only get six grams per cup, and then go all the way down uh, to things like lettuce and mushrooms where there's virtually very, very little protein. Uh, and you can just explain to them whenever you are looking for protein, you seek out uh, meat or legumes. Okay, so carbohydrates are our sources of energy and they're organic substances made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Um, and I always like to make the joke, like, do this look just like, the, the, the amino acids were also made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But you can see the difference in the shape and the structure of those chemical compounds there at the bottom of the screen. And they're also called sugars or starches. <clears throat> Many of us have heard of sugars or starches, and they're the, the primary source of energy for our bodies. Um, in the GI tract, these will be broken down into maltose and glucose, and then absorbed and reused in the body. So good examples of carbohydrates would be like fruits, breads, pastas, beans, potatoes, bran, rice, and even cereals. Okay, so there's many different types of carbohydrates, um, and they're named and categorized based off their structure. So um, monosaccharides <clears throat> are what we call a uh, single base unit carbohydrates. So they only have one base unit, and they're usually the simplest form of sugar and are usually colorless, water-soluble, crystalline, and crystalline solids. And so fructose is the fruit sugar. Uh, glucose is the form of sugar that, you, that the body actually uses as energy. So all other sugars and forms of sugars and carbohydrates will be converted into glucose within the digestive system eventually. And then lactose is from mammal's milk. And these are just pictures of those actual uh, monosaccharides. And you can see that there's only one uh, ring of material for, for each um, saccharide or carbohydrate. And you can also talk here about how similar they look, especially between glucose and um, galactose, because all you see is just a change in where those um, hydroxides are. So that OH there is different, even though the overall structure is very, very similar. And then you can look at fructose, which is actually a pentose sugar, so it only has the five sides. Um, and so that's really interesting to show them how simple it is. 
but how different your body reacts to it. Then there are disaccharides and dimines too, and so there are two sugar bases put together, and then it's going to be for, uh, formed when those sugars are joined together and a molecule of water is removed. And so this includes sucrose, which is just glucose and fructose, lactose, which is glucose and lactose, and maltose, which is glucose and glucose. And there are those structures there. Okay, then we have oligosaccharides, and I always like to ask, does anybody know what an oligosaccharide is? And they all look at me like I'm crazy. Uh, it's just a sugar composed of anywhere from three to ten monosaccharides attached together. So um, <clears throat> there are not a, a lot of these. Uh, they're they're very common in your food, but they're not um, big. And we're talking about digestion and nutrition. Um, so we're going to move on to the next one, which is going to be our polysaccharides. And polysaccharides are going to be a sugar that consists of polymers of chains. So uh, it's going to have monosaccharides layered together. There are um, more than ten monosaccharides layered together. So like starch. Um, it's going to be a long chain of glucose formed by plants in photosynthesis. <clears throat> Talk about starch and with potatoes and rice. And there's cellulose, which are long chains of glucose that are indigestible by humans, and they serve as fiber in the diet. That's, so that's in a lot of plants, a lot of our um, roughage that we feed animals. That's going to have a lot of cellulose, and that's going to help push things through the digestive system. And then there's glycogen, which is just also long chains of glucose formed by the human body. And that's our storage form for glucose. Um, if we ever need it in the future, we can pull glucose out of glycogen and use it for energy. I like to say right here, um, why would starch be digestible and uh, glycogen be used in the body, but not the cellulose? And you can see in the picture, if you go back, uh, Ira, you can see in the picture that starch is um, straight across, and all of the extra arms are there on top of the pro uh, on top of the, the compound, and then in cellulose it goes back and forth. And so those uh, uh, arms are actually preventing enzymes from being able to cut cellulose up. And so it will be a really difficult time um, digesting that. And then we look at the glycogen, you can see that glycogen actually has branches of glucose coming off of it. And neither of the other two forms of, um, of polysaccharides have that, that effect. And so we use glycogen as a storage, pro a storage molecule for our glucose within our muscles. All of them, however, starch, cellulose, and glycogen are made up of chains of glucose. And so you can see that um, polysaccharides can be very variable, can have all different kinds of sugars and carbohydrates um, and, and all types of different monosaccharides in them, but our three major ones are just glucose, so that's kind of neat, I like to point that out to kids. And so people might ask what, um, what compounds actually, what organisms or whatever actually have cellulose in them. An example I like to give is corn, so corn around the wall, kind of the capsule of a kernel of corn is full of cellulose. So if you don't chew your corn, you don't ever actually digest your corn, uh, which is why sometimes you see full corn, corn, full corn kernels, excuse me, in uh, the toilet. Time poster. Yeah, it really is. Okay, so then we have fats, and fats are organic molecules made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. That seems like a theme that our whole presentation is um, But you can see that those are also very different in shape and structure than even our carbohydrates or amino acids. And then there's two different types of fats, and I always like to ask students before I show this, what kind of fat is what kind of fat is healthy and what kind of fat is unhealthy? And I've been often surprised at how many people know the difference. And so we say saturated fats are going to be our unhealthy fats, and then we have unsaturated fats are our healthy fats. And the difference here is that saturated fats only have single bonds, which is the top uh, fat right there you can see, and then unsaturated fats will have double bonds, which you can see there on the bottom of the screen. Um, and then the reason why saturated fats are unhealthy is because they often lead to cardiovascular disease, and that is the number one killer of adults in America today. So uh, this is a, I like to make that point because I like to say this is really important to understanding your health and your, your nutrition um, and understand, is understanding the structure of these fats and why they're unhealthy. And so I always say, okay, well, saturated fats, what does saturated mean? Saturated means that each carbon has is full of something, right? It's fully saturated, and so they're full of hydrogens. So they only have single bonds, and the reason why they're unhealthy is because uh, eventually, if you'll show me, Kyra, eventually uh, those saturated fats can stack like this, and they'll just keep stacking and stacking and stacking and stacking until there's a block of fat, and so uh, saturated fats tend to be solid at room temperature because they actually can stack really easily, whereas unsaturated fats are different shapes and different structures, and they can't they can't lay on one another properly, and so at room temperature they tend to be liquid. And that same thing happens in the body, and so it's um, really cool to show them how the structure 
of the fat actually plays a huge part in the role of the fat in the body. So let's go over some healthy unsaturated and unhealthy saturated fats um, that, we get, that we find every day. So your healthy unsaturated fats, uh, you can find these in vegetable oils, fish, nuts, seeds, olive oil, and avocados. Uh, and these fats are typically liquid at room temperature. So if you see that picture at the bottom, you can see the, the fish and the different oils, the avocado and the nuts. So uh, the, the oils especially are definitely liquid at room temperature. Your unhealthy saturated fats um, are in dairy products, animal fats, so the, the fat that you trim off of your meat or your chicken, whatever it is, that fat. Um, oils like coconut oil, cottonseed oil, and palm kernel oil. And these fats are typically solid at room temperature. So two things that students have around the house a lot butter and then cooking oil, like olive oil or canola oil. So if you explain to them the difference, if you look at that, butter is obviously going to be your solid, unhealthy fat. Most people understand butter is unhealthy, but if you tag that along with it being solid and saturated fat, it helps students to understand uh, the correlation there. And then things like olive oil, a lot of people understand that olive oil is a healthier oil for you, and so tying that in as well. And Crisco works too for the Yeah, saturated. Crisco for your saturated. Um, but I like to bring them with me when I go into actual, give an actual presentation on this, and that way kids can see the physical differences and they understand that these are both facts, but they look a lot different in real life. Yeah, and maybe if, if you do decide to do that, um, make sure it still has its nutrition label on it and compare saturated versus unsaturated fats on the label. So let's continue on with fat. So a fat cell is called an adipocyte. And that picture there in the right corner is uh, a cell, like a slide of the cellular uh, level of adipocyte. So you can see how the, the, all that white space between them is where the fat is stored. And the little dark um, circles there are the nucleus of the cell. So free fatty acids are consumed and absorbed within the GI tract. And we'll talk more about that later. Um, but these will be packaged into glycerols to form un units called triacylglycerides. And then those are stored within the adipocyte. So that's all that white space you see in the slide. And so if you look there, you can see uh, glycerols and then also your triacylglyceride. Um, and, your free fatty and your free fatty acid, just the different structures of those. So when you consume fat, you're actually consuming the triacylglycerides and then your body breaks it down into free fatty acids and glycerol to be absorbed. It's much smaller and much easily, more easily absorbed. And then once that happens, it, once it enters the bloodstream, the body remakes that triacylglyceride uh, and then will send it to the fat cell to be stored. So a really fun fact here is that you can always, your entire life, every day of your life, you can always make adipocytes, but you can never kill them. And that's why many people are always talking about, um, but kids like to say, is that why you can gain weight quicker than you burn weight? And you say yes, because those fat, those fat cells are still there waiting to be filled with fat. Um, and so when you burn fat, you're not actually killing those adipocytes. What you're doing is releasing the triacylglycerides that are stored there into the bloodstream to be used for energy. Effectively, you're shrinking the size of the adipocyte. And so when you lose weight, you're just removing the st what's stored inside those cells um, and burning it for energy. And that's slowly causing shrinkage. Whereas when you gain weight, you're storing those triacylglycerides constantly, and the, the cells will get larger and larger and larger. And you may even create new cells yes, at that point. Yes, once they're full. Yeah. Right. So let's talk a little bit about diabetes. Um, it's something that a lot of students may have interacted with, with family members, friends, um, or maybe even some of your students may have diabetes. So there's two, st two types and it's important to go over those. Type 1 is a genetic autoimmune disease where you're unable to produce insulin, and type 2 is acquired. Either you don't produce enough insulin or your body has insulin resistance. Uh, so let's talk about what insulin does for a minute. So insulin helps your cells absorb that glucose to create it for, to use it for energy. And so insulin itself does not actually facilitate the absorption of glucose, uh, but it does encourage basically your cells to take it up. And it is something that's released at mealtime so that your cells are ready, prepared to take that energy to use those nutrients, take it into the cell, and use that for your body's um, energy storage. And so if you don't, if you have an insulin resistance, 
then you're not actually able to absorb as much glucose into your system, and it can be really damaging to your body. Well, insulin resistance in itself is, um, but the insulin's being produced, but the body is not responding to it. Right. So, like, type diabetes is often understood as not having enough insulin, but you may have plenty of insulin, but your body is just shutting down, saying, I don't hear the insulin, or for whatever reason, the insulin not, is not communicating with the cell that it's time to start absorbing glucose. And so, um, type 2 diabetes is a good... Uh, applicable way to think about fats and how fats are going to affect your diet. So let's pop back over. So fat can actually play a really large role in the onset of type 2 diabetes. Um, a lot of people understand that. So adipocytes secrete adipokines, which is a chemical. Adipokines are hormones that impair blood glucose tolerance, which will lead to your insulin resistance. So to prevent or reverse type 2 diabetes, Often the patient just needs to eat right and exercise. And this is a great explanation of that uh, because by eating right and exercising, you're reducing the amount of fat in your fat cells and their activity level. So you're reducing the amount of adipokines that are being secreted. So you don't have that impairment of your blood glucose tolerance. And that way your body says, hey, there's insulin, I should listen to it. Exactly. Okay, so then there are vitamins and they are quite a few. There's fat soluble, which are gonna be our A, D, E, and K. And then, so that's why I like to say here, so fats can be really bad for you um, if not eaten in the proper amount or quantity or the proper um, types of fats that you're consuming. Um, but do you think that fats are completely, should be out of your diet completely? And a lot of kids say yes, because they think that fats are just terrible. Uh, but in fact, we have many vitamins that you can't produce that you only acquire by eating fats, and animal fats particularly. Um, and so uh, the fat soluble vitamins that we list there are all the different vitamins that you have you acquire by eating fat. So I like to say, so fat is good when you eat it in, you know, in moderation and you watch how much you're eating and what kinds of fats you're eating. And there's water soluble like B-complex and C vitamins. And those, that's just a little chart that shows you um, the different types of foods and where you would get um, different types of vitamins and from which food types. And then there's minerals, uh, the major minerals. I ask, a lot of times I ask, what, what does major mean? And people are like, oh, they're big. <laughs> Or, oh, they're really, really important. And you say, yeah, so you need more of these, these minerals um, in your body to survive. And that includes sodium, potassium, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, manganese, sulfur, cobalt, and chlorine. And then there are trace minerals. And I ask them, what does trace mean? Well, okay, but you just need fewer of them. That's right. So iron, zinc, copper, selenium, iodine, fluorine, and chromium are all good examples of trace minerals. And then there's, again, a picture that shows you where some of these different minerals can come from and what, what kinds of foods you would need to eat. So now let's start our discussion on digestion. So at this point, we've already gone over the different types of nutrients that we're going to be putting into our body. And from here, we're going to look at the organ system, the whole digestive system, what is involved there and where these nutrients are taken up. So we're gonna start here at the mouth and esophagus. So in your mouth, you have your chewing with your teeth and saliva from salivary glands, which includes bicarbonate and amylase. So a good thing to ask here is, so is there mechanical breakdown or chemical breakdown in the mouth? A lot of people will think that it's only mechanical breakdown, but in reality, because of that saliva, you have both mechanical and chemical breakdown occurring. And I often ask what amylase does, because some kids really do know, it's surprising. But amylase breaks down carbohydrates into um, maltose or glucose. So that's really important. So let's let's finish swallowing real quick this mouth and esophagus slide and then we have a few models for you. So swallowing happens in the mouth and transports that food into the esophagus, which is just um, a muscular tube that connects your mouth to your stomach. And okay, so let's go back. Kyra, will you show us? So there's actually two different types of teeth. Um, if you've ever looked in your dog's mouth, your cat's mouth, uh, their teeth actually look very similar to ours. And we have our good friend Shorty right here. Um, and you can see his teeth uh, that are in his mouth. And they look very similar to ours. They have the canines, they have the incisors and molars. Um, and there's a, a dental formula that basically every mammal follows. Um, and they're all very similar. But then we have animals like horses and cows, and if you've ever owned maybe a horse, you know that they need to get their teeth floated, um, and all of that sounds kind of weird. So it is kind of weird. But they have special teeth that don't ever stop growing, and they are 
uh, super long and they just grow, 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 and they get worn as time goes on. And so here is an example of that. Um, I'm not sure if you can see very well, but all of these teeth are flat on top and they're perfect for grinding. So when these animals eat, they're mostly eating roughages and forages. And so to break up that cellulose that we talked about that isn't very easily digestible, um, they'll grind their teeth to kind of make that into a meal. So often you'll see your horse or your cow eating in a figure eight pattern where they're grinding this way, whereas dogs will grab and rip and tear, or people grab them here. The horse or the cow will eat like, you know, we, yeah. we often make fun of that in cartoons, but it's actually a real, the real way they chew and how they actually eat their food. Yeah. Let's talk about the stomach. So in the stomach, um, you go, you can see that circle, that's where your esophagus meets your stomach, there's a little sphincter there, um, but your stomach releases acids and enzymes that break down food even further. So even though you just chewed it up, sometimes we don't do that great of a job, and so this acid, um, all of these secretions that your stomach has, will help break down that even further into more manageable parts where you're, where they can later be absorbed. And so you have um, things like gastrin, secretin, and HCL that are secreted in your stomach. Uh, and then you also use muscular contractions to mis mix and degrade the food. And this mixing of those enzymes with your food particles creates what we call chyme. So anything from here on out, that substance is considered chyme. I also, to, right here, I'd like to say, okay, so if the acid in the stomach is so strong, it, if you poured it on your arm, it would actually eat through the skin on your arm and create a hole. Um, and so I'll let, them, I'll let them think about that for a minute, and then they're like, a lot of times somebody will ask, well, then why doesn't it hurt the stomach? Or I'll ask it myself, and they'll think, oh, that's a good question. And then um, sometimes people know, sometimes people don't, but there's a thick mucus layer within the stomach of the act. The stomach actually produces and secretes um, into the stomach into the stomach lumen, and it will line the entire stomach and protect it from that harsh uh, hydrochloric acid. And so you can talk kind of about stomach ulcers um, here because that's where either you have too much acid uh, or you don't have enough mucus there. There's an imbalance and it creates um, sores inside your stomach that can be incredibly painful. Or acid reflux even. Oh yeah. Um, as, as you can always ask them if anybody's ever had acid reflux or the burning sensation in their throat. And that's that acid um, burbling out or gurgling out with uh, food during mixing and, and commotion within the stomach. And that actually because the esophagus doesn't have that thick mucus layer, it will burn the edges of that esophagus and you can feel that. So that's kind of neat. So we have examples of stomachs here. Um, this is actually a horse stomach. If you can see it, ours actually looks pretty similar. It's not this big. Um, but you can see inside of it even, um, you can see all the different fenestrations there, the, what's called rugae, um, as well as just kind of where the lining would have been. Uh, so it's actually, it's, it's pretty neat looking. Yeah. And horses are called monogastric, um, which means one stomach, and this is because they have one giant compartment in their stomach. You can see that's one big giant hole. Um, and that's, that's what humans have, and pigs, um, and a lot of our canines or our, uh, fe our felines all have our own mon monogastric. But then we hear things like cows have four stomachs, and, and that's a, a common misunderstanding. But it's actually that cows have one big stomach with four separate compartments. And so this is their big stomach, and we call them ruminants. And that's because they have four compartments. And so we'll go through real quick. We have the big rumen where a lot of the food takes place, goes in, and it, it starts to um, deteriorate. They start absorbing nutrients right here. And then food can pass into reticulum, which is this guy right here. So then flow into the omasum, which is this guy right here, and then into the abomasum, which is their, their version of our stomach. It's right here, abomasum. And then it will flow into their small intestine. And so um, you, if you could look, I mean, it may not be very easy on the video, but um, if you could actually look or feel these different compartments, each of them have different shape, different structure. Um, like we call the rumen has little um, pointy things, we call them villi. They're, they're, they're kind of rough and fluffy, essentially, for absorption here. And then we have the reticulum of a honeycomb. It looks like a honeycomb. You may not be able to see this, but um, it does. It looks like well, look up, look a honeycomb. Um, and then the omasum we call a butcher's bible because it has pages. It looks like folds that are pages. That look like pages. So we often call that the butcher's bible. And then the abomasum looks just like the normal stomach. 
and so it will have the rugae and um, it'll just have the monogastric. And so ruminants are cows, goats, deer, elk, um, things like that. So here's Shorty again. Um, so you can see Shorty's stomach, it's kind of been, uh, Shorty has been, is a dog who's been sliced uh, in half right here. And so you can see his stomach is this big hole here underneath what is his liver. Um, Shorty's monogastric too as a dog. He is part of that family. Um, and so you can see his monogastric stomach coming in. Let's see. Can you see? We can't actually see very much. No. Um, but you can just see his stomach is right here. This is where stomachs are normally located in a dog, uh, usually just under, just past the rib cage, depending on how much they've eaten. And so um, the understanding the different compartments and what they do actually will allow you to understand that cows start, start absorbing nutrients within their stomach, whereas monogastrics, just the whole point of the stomach is just to break down food and get it into littler pieces so that more absorption can happen later in the intestines. And so um, even horses and people, from that point, the mono, the two monogastrics we like to think about, um, they'll even absorb food differently as they go through the intestines. So understanding the anatomy would help you understand the physiology behind um, the digestive system. So now for the small intestine. Uh, this is the entry point of bile from the gallbladder. So shortly after the stomach leaves, uh, or the food leaves the stomach and enters the small intestine, there is bile that is put into the gall, from the gallbladder that's put into the small intestine, which includes bicarbonate uh, and emulsification for emulsification of fat. And it's also the entry point of pancreatic enzymes, like trypsin, which is for protein digestion, lipase for fat digestion, and amylase for carbohydrate digestion. So in the small intestine, there are villi and microvilli that allow the reabsorption of these fluids and nutrients from chyme. Um, and it, the primary site of nutrient absorption is the small intestine. So for most animals. For most animals, that's right. Uh, and so the villi and microvilli actually just increase that surface area that's available for that reabsorption. And so that way all of that fluid, all of that kind that's running through the small intestine is able to hopefully make contact with some of that surface area with the villi or with the microvilli and have those nutrients be absorbed. So this is a really good picture of the microvilli versus the villi. And so you can see there at the bottom of the screen um, is the actual cells of the small intestine. And layering on top of the cells are these little tiny microvilli. And then the cells then line the whole villi. And so you're, up, you're increasing your absorption area to 300 times. Um, and that really helps you gain the most from your food that you can while it's passing through your intestines. Another really important part to know about that picture is that the villi have blood vessels. Do you see the blood vessels there uh, lining the villi? Um, if you shed the, the villi, you actually have bleeding. Um, and if you, shed, if you shed the microvilli and the villi together, you'll have a um, bloody, mucoid-looking diarrhea, which is um, really important when we're talking about our case study. Um, but then, so this is a major side, of, like I said, the major side of mucoid bloody diarrhea uh, due to loss of the, the villi and microvilli that line the walls. And this will lead to a lack of reabsorption of water, and, um, as well as nutrients. And so uh, you'll get a diarrhea, essentially, when, when you lose these two anatomical structures. So this is that picture I was telling you about earlier that has different, um, prote the, the different types of enzymes that break down the foods. And so I always say, this looks like a crazy picture, right? Like maybe it's too much for you to understand. But when you start looking at it at a deeper level, you can see that there's a bile duct that's leading um, some different bicarbonate um, out into the lumen of the intestine and it's breaking down fat. And so you can see that the fat goes to emulsified fat and then there's a pancreatic duct right next to it there that comes up and lets go of trypsinogen, which is trypsin, uh, amylase, and lipase. And the lipase goes to the fat and breaks down the fat into free fatty acids and glycerols. The amylase goes over to the starch and breaks it down into maltose and glucose. And then you have trypsin, which is breaking down that protein into amino acids. So that all of those little tiny pieces of those different proteins and molecules are being absorbed through the small intestine um, to be used inside the body. So we have a little tiny piece of a small intestine here. Really, the small intestine, if you've ever been deer hunting or anything like that and you've actually skinned an animal, it, it's this big part that falls out immediately that's a jumbled, looks like a jumbled mess of um, intestines. It's what we think of when we think of intestines, we think of small intestine. Um, and so this is just a tiny, tiny piece of that small intestine, clearly. Um, but you, inside, you really can't see it on the screen, but inside there are these little tiny 
um, villi, you can feel them, you can see them, um, and they let, will line the entire small intestine. Uh, and then this is the junction actually of the small intestine to the large intestine. And so you'll see here the cecum, or uh, in human terms, this is the appendix. So, that's kind of right here. So in shorty, um, hopefully you can kind of see, but remember this is this hole is his stomach, and then there's this whole jumbled mess of like tubes, it kind of looks like, just a bunch of little holes on this side, which is all his small intestine. So by cutting straight through that big jumbled mess that Emily was talking about, um, we just get to see the little cross sections of it. And so we just see little holes, but basically you can tell from this that it, it folds on itself, makes a bunch of twists and turns, um, and it's super, super long. So that's really small intestine. Okay, then we get our moving to large intestine. This is going to reabsorb most of the fluids to condense the chyme into the feces. So the whole goal of the large intestine really is to help pull that water out that was put in, all those different enzymes, all those different um, uh, secretions that happened in the small intestine um, are full of water. And so our goal is to pull that water back out so we're conserving water in the body. Um, and so this is actually the major site of secretory diarrhea. If um, the anatomy, if something is going wrong in the large intestine, you're going to have more watery diarrhea. And so um, we like to think small intestine absorbs nutrients and has the villi and microvilli. And so when you have problems there, you get bloody mucoid diarrhea. And the large intestine has no mi has no villi, but has little tiny microvilli and for absorption of water. And so when you have problems there, you get a very watery diarrhea. Um, and so that's something we can talk about during Max's case um, to help them un the kids understand the difference and how they would know where to look for the problem. And then um, there's a, it's a lack of reabsorption of water and, uh, due to a loss of microvilli would lead to your sedentary diarrhea. And so uh, this is a really good comparison of the small intestine to the large intestine. You can see that they look very different under a microscope. So um, there are no villi in the, in the large intestine. There's just uh, little microvilli. Whereas in the small intestine, you can see there are very the tips are very long intestinal villi. And so there's a it's a good example. And then we have a real example um, that we'll show you. One good point to make here though is there are not villi um, in the large intestine, but you still have intestinal crypts, which kind of makes it look like there might be villi. But really, that those are um, I guess. Those are crypts, so they're invaginations within the wall instead of projections from the wall. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's a really important point to make because some people, some students may not understand that right off the bat, that, that villi will be your projections and you will still have intestinal crypts in the large intestine, which are just invaginations. The point of the crypts is to make mucus, to cover, right. the, to cover the, the lining of the walls. Mm -hmm. And then this is a good real example of what they look like under so there's a big difference there between small intestine and large intestine. You can physically see it. So you can see the crypts going down, um, and you can see the, the, the lye sticking out of the small intestine. So that's kind of cool. And so the very end of the digestive tract um, hopefully ends in the toilet. We have a good example of the large intestine here for you. Um, this is an equine descending colon. Um, so that's part of the large intestine. You can see that there's these saccules here. Um, you can see these and little round, nice and large. These little round pieces. Um, what they're doing is, is that what this is doing is making the feces that we know horses make, which are the, the balls of feces that come out. Um, and talking about poop is really gross, and so I'm really sorry if it's grossing you out. But um, that's where this is being made, so that those feces are one big fluid jumble mess. They come into the large intestine where the water is being pulled out, and they're turning into what we know as feces coming out of the exit. So at the exit, um, something that we all need to talk about, hopefully it ends somewhere appropriate, um, like the toilet or the litter box, but it's a very important part of monitoring the health in you and your animal, um, your pets, because it can tell you a lot about the digestive health of your animal. So let's go back to our case study for a minute and revisit Max and his vomiting and diarrhea. Let's just review really quick. This is a good part to review um, his signalment and chief complaint. He's six month old, intact male Labrador retriever, and he has vomiting and diarrhea. He's suffering from lethargy and fatigue, dysentery, and dehydration. And then we can review his history of present illness. 
Uh, it started yesterday morning. It's been very frequent throughout the day. It appears mucoid and bloody. He is potty training, but pooping in the house anyway. And he, he began vomiting a few hours after uh, his first spot of diarrhea. The vomit is clear like water, and he has not been interested in his toys, even his favorite stuff, Bunny. He stopped eating and drinking. He's the only pet in the home, and he's an inside and outside dog. Okay, so I like to be right here. I like to stop and say, okay, so um, he has bloody mucoid diarrhea. Where do we think the problem is arising from? And this helps the kids go back to what we've talked about, about the anatomy and the physiology of what's going on. And, and they're hopefully have listened and heard that small intestine has the villi, which has the blood vessels in it. And if you lose those villi, then you're going to get a bloody mucoid diarrhea um, versus the large intestine, the secretory diarrhea. And so right here, we should already know where we're going to go look for our problem. Our problem is probably going to be the small intestine. And so if we go back to the um, PowerPoint, then once we've established that, we start talking about, okay, so what are some things that can cause issues in the small intestine? And a lot of times you'll get, you're going to get more generic answers like bacteria, viruses, poisons or toxins, um, and things like that. And that's okay. That's perfectly fine. Uh, but we have actual differential diagnosis, so I feel like doctors, and, you know, yeah. they, can, they can look at real diseases that cause things like this, such as canine parvovirus, canine distemper, uh, infectious canine hepatitis, canine coronavirus, which is a virus, both uh, canine hepatitis and the coronavirus are viruses. And then we have bacteria, oh, all of those are bacteria, are viruses. And then we have bacteria, like mastocemia from salmonellosis, campylobacter, um, both of those are really good uh, bloody diarrhea causing uh, bacteria. And then we have hemorrhagic gastroenteritis, uh, poisonings. And so all, all those are good examples, and you can show them that just by reviewing uh, bacteria, viruses, like things like that, they can come up with a good list of differentials that may be going, that might actually be going on in the body. And so the actual diagnosis through testing, we tell them we tested the animal, they're on site, and through actual, through actual testing, we actually got parvovirus. So this is a good example, a good picture of Max with his parvovirus. That's actually his diarrhea. And I was like, say, do you think that's pretty bloody diarrhea? And they're like, oh yeah, that's gross. Okay, good, so that's bloody diarrhea. So parvovirus is a virus. It causes gastroenteritis, which just means uh, inflammation of the stomach and the intestines. It's transmitted fecally, fecal orally and through inhalation. So um, it's very, very contagious. Uh, one puppy can have it and pass it to another puppy until the entire litter has it. Uh, parvovirus, um, and it's very difficult to clean or kill. It, it will live in the environment for years. Um, it's, it, it's very difficult to kill, and, and so thus it gets transmitted very easily. It requires uh, a solution of 1 to 32 dilution of leach in water uh, to be killed, and it will live, in the, like I said, it lives in the environment for a very long time. So really important about parvovirus is it's actually uh, it's very lethal. Uh, when puppies get it, it's hard to save them, and they tend to die quickly and painfully. Um, however, uh, parvovirus is 100% preventable by vaccination. So uh, those puppy vaccines we all hate to pay for because they're so expensive and it's frustrating to go back three weeks, every three weeks or so. Um, they're so vital to preventing diseases like parvovirus or distemper virus um, and, and preventing the loss of your pet, uh, which is tragic for kids with puppies especially because they're so little and cute. Um, so, Get your dogs vaccinated, a little side note. Uh, encourage your students to get their dogs vaccinated. It can save the dog's life. So the pathogenesis of parvovirus, so how it actually affects the dog. Um, the virus infects the mature cells that are covering the upper two thirds of the small intestine villi. So it infects those cells that have the microvilli on them, which will cause the sloughing of de dead mature cells and effectively blunt the villi. So by taking those cells off, the villi actually begin to just basically die and get washed away with the rest of the contents of the intestine, which uh, removes a lot of that surface area for absorption there. And the small intestine can no longer absorb those nutrients because those villi are gone. The cells that we're planning on absorbing that material aren't there anymore, and any cells that are attempting to replace them are immature and not able to actually absorb an adequate amount of nutrients. So vomiting and diarrhea results. And just, here it's important to remember that those villi that are being sloughed have blood vessels in them. And so as they slough, there's bleeding occurring into the intestine. Um, and that's what, you, that's what you're seeing at the end when you have the bloody diarrhea. And also, since those blood vessels are open and there's bacteria in the gut that help digest food, 
that new, those bacteria are easily can easily get into the bloodstream and cause septicemia, which is a usually the result of parvovirus is they get a bacterial infection in their blood. That's a healthy small intestine. They're nice and pink and they're fluffy and they look good and healthy. And then this picture is a picture of a dog with parvovirus, and you can see that that small intestine is. Uh, bloody, it looks it looks inflamed, it doesn't look healthy, it, it, it just looks really, really bad. And that's about what, what's going on inside. So this is a good diagram of what's happening with parvovirus. Like even Palin said, she said that those cells are dying and they're trying to be replaced, but they're being replaced with immature cells. And so eventually you'll have this effect of cutting off the villi um, as the disease progresses. And you can see that happening. Um, from one to six, one being the healthy, normal intestinal uh, villi, whereas six being the part of the diseased villi. Okay, so for fun, we've done, now we've those maps, we know what's going on with him. So for fun, we like to add a little math in here um, to show them that math is important, <laughs> and they'll use math the rest of your life. Um, so to keep Max from getting further dehydrated, we want to keep him from throwing up, which we, we'll then use an anti-emetic called metoclopramide. If Max weighs 14 pounds and the recommended dosage is 35 milligrams per kilogram for metoclopramide with a drug concentration of 20 milligrams per milliliter, how many milliliters of drug should you administer to Max? And we'll give the helpful hint that one kilogram equals 2.2 pounds. And this is just a good um, demonstration of dimensional analysis and their understanding of dimensional analysis. And so we'll usually let them work it out. Hopefully somebody comes with the answer and then we'll show them the math problem that we actually have. So 14 pounds is converted to kilograms. Kilograms is converted to um, milligrams uh, for the dosage of the drug, and then the milligrams are converted to milliliters for the concentration, and you get 11.136 milliliters of, of uh, metal cover mine to the dog. Um, how common is it in the environment, <laughs> and are there any other organisms that may be vectors for the virus? Basically, how is it transferred other than just the sniffing? And right. So, um, there, it's not transferred by bugs or anything like that. Um, not common, um, but it is uh, very, very common in the environment. So we like to say if you have a puppy who's not vaccinated, you probably shouldn't interact with other dogs, and you definitely shouldn't go to the dog park. Um, that's because if he's not vaccinated yet or his vaccinations aren't done, he's at high risk for acquiring something like parvo or distemper even. Um, and and it, it seems a little admirable that, you know, if the do no dog is a dog park or sick, then how is the animal getting it? But really, those animals are running, and they're digging. If you ever see your dog run in the dog park, they'll, they'll run, and they kick up a lot of dust, and they're in the grass rolling their ball, or their nose is digging in the dirt while they're digging. I mean, there's there's so many ways that a dog can inhale parvovirus at any moment while being in that um, at the dog park, but it's even at your house. So I know people who had a puppy, and it got parvovirus from wherever it got it from, um, and then they brought it back to their house, and of course, the dog and diarrhea all in the house and threw up in the house like Max situation um, and that left parvovirus there on the floors. Well, you can't always bleach your floors. I mean, that, you know, that's not going to be a, a, a good thing to do if you don't have like some like, linoleum or something like that. Um, if you have carpet, that's not a good thing to do. Um, and so she couldn't kill it and that meant that her next puppy that she brought to that home was guaranteed to get it again. And so um, what, we, what we recommended to her was if that's happened to you or, or somebody has had parvovirus in your household, um, then you should get the puppy vaccinated prior to bringing it to your home. And so like get all three sets of shots, all three boosters away from the house and then let the puppy come live with you once it's been vaccinated. Additionally, um, I just want to point out that canine parvovirus, so the, par the parvovirus that our dogs are getting is only in dogs. Uh, they can't get it from cats, they can't get it from any other living creature, but we mentioned that it is in incredibly hard to kill and can be transmitted fecal orally, so from the excrement of one animal, from the feces of one animal, to the mouth of the other, and through inhalation. And so she mentioned a lot, like you're, you're digging up a lot, the animal is running around a lot, a lot of dust flying around, really easy to inhale. Um, but you also, you don't want to forget that they're running around a lot, stepping probably in other animals' feces, um, even if it's not noticeable, and later on they're going to go home and clean themselves. Well, that part of virus is liquid. Yeah. I mean, when you saw the diarrhea in that picture with the Mac, with Max, it, I mean, it's water. I mean, it, there's not much left blood in the intestines to poop out because they've been pooping so much. So then it just kind of sinks into the grass, and you don't even know. I mean, your yeah. dog's walking all over it, and then they go home and clean their paws if it's covered in parvovirus. So 
And then I also want to point out, though, that um, the animals that are at risk for parvovirus are the animals who have not been vaccinated for parvovirus and animals less than about a year and a half old. Mm -hmm. Once they've passed that age, they're usually um, capable of fighting off that disease, that virus, but before then their immune systems are not really capable unless they've been vaccinated. Also, um, I've seen, it's very rare, but I've seen older dogs get parvovirus who were not vaccinated as a puppy, um, but it's not lethal. It makes them really sick and they get dehydrated, but they don't, they usually don't die from it. Um, and then also, the vaccines are not foolproof. No vaccine is foolproof. You can get the flu vaccine and, and still get the flu. And the same thing goes for your dog. Um, the issue here, or the, the, the pro here is that regardless, if you get the vaccination, you can actually reduce the severity and the length of duration the virus runs its course in your puppy. And usually animals that have had a vaccination and get parvovirus, they live. And that's a lot more than that's what's said for dogs who aren't vaccinated and get parvovirus. And the parvovirus vaccine is definitely more effective than your average flu vaccine. Yes. I do want to point that out yeah. too, because the vaccine, yeah, yeah, flu vaccine varies year to year, and sometimes it's a hit or miss, sometimes it's only like 20% effective. Um, the efficacy of the parvovirus vaccination is much greater than that. Yeah. So you're, you're pretty much guaranteeing that you're either going to prevent the disease completely or you're going to reduce its severity so that your dog doesn't die. Yeah. Good investment. Yeah. Okay, so what we're going to show you now is I, I mentioned a few times during the presentation that um, horses are a little different. So they might be monogastric, they have one stomach, but they actually process food differently. And when we're talking about small intestine, we said this is the primary site for nutrient absorption in most animals. And the horses are our exception. So the horses, I don't know if you know, but horses, they have two main common problems. They have foot problems or they have stomach problems or digestive problems. We call it colic a lot. And so um, this actually is the, uh, <coughs> the intestines of a horse. And you can see they're mighty large and heavy. Um, so let's, I'm going to pull it over. Yeah. Okay, so you can see here that horses have um, enormous intestines. And they're going to play a huge part in how they ferment food. Um, so we call horses hind gut fermenters, which means that much of their absorption is going to actually happen in the hind gut, which is your large intestine. Um, and so this is the large intestine of a horse. Um, and you can see how very, very large it is and how complicated its folding is. And so in the horse, it'll actually be folded like this. And then you'll sometimes when you get colic or something, this will actually twist. It's called torsion. Or you can get strangulation from other organs or other vessels. Um, and that can cause a lot of your colic problems. Um, the issue with horses is that they don't get or they don't absorb most of their nutrients until the large intestine and that's when things are moving very quickly out of their body, right? So they don't get to absorb nearly as much as a cow, per se, who starts absorbing nutrients within the stomach. And so um, a problem you often see with horses is they'll start eating their own feces or eating other horses' feces and that's kind of disgusting when we think about it. Um, but this helps them um, to reabsorb the nutrients they should have got the first time when they when they when they actually process their food. They kind of just get a second pass, a second dose of all their of own that, food. all of those nutrients that probably got. Um, so while that's kind of disgusting, cows with the ruminants, the ruminants, they do something different. They start absorbing nutrients in their stomach. Um, but one of the ways they can do this is by doing something we call uh, chewing the cud. So sometimes you'll look out in the pasture of cows. And they're not really eating grass, but they're sitting there chewing something like all the time. I mean, they chew eight hours a day. It's kind of insane. Um, and what they're actually doing is they're actually regurgitating some of the food material that's in their stomach, and it's going back up to their mouth, and they're re-chewing their food. Uh, and this just helps to break down a lot of those plant materials they're eating and that cellulose that they're eating, uh, and they're really breaking it down into smaller and smaller pieces. So they can start absorbing nutrients immediately right away. Um, and they can, even in the small intestine, they can get most of their nutrients. And so a cow will never eat its poop, but it eats its throw up. So, I mean, I think we, monogastric humans got it pretty good. We don't yeah. throw up and eat it, or we don't poop and eat it. So, I mean, I'm, I don't know, it's your pick. I'm going to win. <laughs> win, win. But those are just some differences in anatomy and physiology uh, within the animal kingdom. Obviously, people don't do that. We do lose some uh, nutrients because our absorption happens mostly in the small intestine, um, but we get many of the nutrients that we are chewing up and eating, so the first time around. Okay. And we have one more thing over here. It's almost, it's kind of like a put the tail on the donkey, but you use intestines instead. Mm -hmm. um, so we call it pin we intestines have, on George. Yeah, so this is our wonderful model George here who we have taped up on the wall. Um, he's literally 
just a drawing on butcher paper and then we laminated him and so it's pretty easy to do uh, in your own classroom and then we have printed and laminated models of large intestine small intestine yeah small intestine stomach liver and pancreas uh, and basically what you can do here you can create multiple um, I guess units of this and you can give it to groups and have them organize their intestines their stomach uh, their liver all of that onto George here um, or you could have them do it as a class kind of go through and have one at a time somebody take volunteers and have them pin it on so there. So the goal is for them to get in the right anatomical place and the right flow of food. So we have mouth to esophagus to stomach to small intestine which is going to be here to large intestine which then goes across the small intestine like that and the liver would be up here and the pancreas would be down here. So that's kind of um, the organization that you want your students to get uh, and so it, it's kind of a fun little game kind of like pin the tail on the donkey but it really gets them thinking about in their body what does this look like uh, and in their body how does this flow happen so fun little game and then we have uh, one more game for you that takes a few volunteers uh, it's something that you'll do with your whole classroom and it represents basically it represents the small intestine and what happens during parvo um, so kind of what you're gonna do I'm gonna get this chair out of the way here so I always get the students to line up shoulder to shoulder two lines facing one another that are parallel so you'll end up having two lines like this of students facing one another like this and I say, I pick out maybe, you know, depending on how large your class is, I pick like six or seven different people, and I make them walk over to the edge and be by the edge, and I'll, I'll talk to them in a second. So this group right here that's lined up like this will be the small intestine, and their arms are going to be their villi, so they have really long villi, and then their fingers are going to be their micro villi, and so, and so they, can, they can do like this, and they're going to be the, the, the small intestine. Yeah, and when you line them up, you want them to be shoulder to shoulder like Emily and I were, and you also want them to be far enough apart that whenever they stick their arms out, they're still at least a foot um, between each side's arms yeah. be sticking out. And then we walk over here and we'll talk about um, to these kids who I pulled aside, and they're going to be nutrients. And so their goal is to stick their hands by their side, and all they're going to do is walk real slow and turn through the two lines. And the whole goal and whole point of this game is I like to make a competition one side versus the other. And I say, okay, your, your goal is to grab the nutrients and pull it behind you. So you're going to absorb the nutrient. Um, and then uh, at the end, we count to see how many that each side gets. And yeah. then, they, you know, they win or they lose. And they get bragging rights about being the best small intestine And ever. make sure your students know, especially the ones lined up as the intestine, whenever they're grabbing um, for the nutrients that either they need to make sure they don't move their feet. Their feet have to be perfectly still. Maybe if you have a line on the floor or something like that. They can't pick up their feet off that line, and they can only grab the nutrients by the arms. That way, things don't get too physical. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, um, we tell the nutrients that if they touch them or they grab them and start pulling, they should just go with it. Don't fight right. it. Just go with them. Um, and so, then the first time through, we have normal anatomy and physiology. So, we have normal villi, microvilli, and as the nutrients pass, people are probably going to grab them, and they're going to get all the nutrients. And so, you're going to get, oh, what a wonderful small intestine. Um, Y'all are great. You got all the nutrients. So you're a healthy, healthy animal. And then I like to make them stick other arms. I say, now you're an animal that's going to have a virus that's going to take away your microvilli. So I go through and I like to act like I'm chopping their fingers off because that's funny and they love it. And so um, they will, now I say you can only use your fist to grab the nutrients. Um, and so you can only use your villi. So the only thing that's present is your villi. And so we'll have the nutrients walk through. And this time, maybe one or two will make it to the end. Um, and you can say, look, so you can see that losing your microvilli leaves you nutrients that you didn't get to absorb. And that's going to be excreted in feces. And so you don't get those nutrients. And you can see how maybe uh, loss of those microvilli could lead to water, water, wow, watery diarrhea in the large intestine, um, as well as loss of nutrient absorption in the small intestine. And then I'm good again. I say, okay, now I'm the parvovirus. So I'm going to come through and I'm going to chop off all your microvilli, off all of your microvilli and your villi. And so eventually they're going to end up having blunted villi. And our blunted villi are going to be our elbows. And so then I'm like, okay, I tell the nutrients secretly, quietly. I say, hey, it's your life goal to get to the end of this tunnel. If you don't get to the end of this tunnel, you're a terrible, terrible nutrient. And so then they say, okay, we can do that. And usually the kids cannot grab 
the nutrients. Like they just they're so far apart, yeah. I can't get them. And at this point, it'll be really tempting for them to pick up their feet off of the uh, off of the line or wherever you have it to kind of move and, and dive in because they're starting to get competitive with it. Um, but make sure that they don't. Make sure that you have them as still as possible on that line. That way, nobody falls and nobody gets hurt. Nobody gets a nice little elbow to the face or anything. Mm -hmm. so. so in the end, they get all, almost all of them will get to the end. And I like to make the joke right here because I think it's hilarious. I'm like, oh, look at all that diarrhea. And they all laugh because they think, oh, I, it was my life goal to get down here and now I'm diarrhea. And so um, that you can show them, like physically, that many of the nutrients and even water got to the end of the line and is now being excreted in the feces. And that's why we get diarrhea. And all of that material, like the blood coming out of the villi, as well as the mucus and the slime of the villi, is coming out with it. And you're going to end up seeing a bloody mucodiarrhea. And the animal is going to be dehydrated and malnourished. They want to know, is there a specific brand of animal food or um, any kind of uh, quality control for animal food, specifically for dogs, that has all of the necessary nutrients? So that's actually a great question. And it's very um, controversial right now. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so let's talk about pet food for a minute. Um, so your major brands are all evaluated by AFCO which is kind of a quality control uh, organization that tells you whether or not that diet is balanced and complete. So if the dog of or the bag of dog food that you have has that AFCO seal, it says balanced and complete on it, has been evaluated by AFCO and is balanced and complete. Um, a lot of people are saying maybe uh, my dog needs to be grain free, gluten free, um, all of these things that we think for ourselves need to be happening. Um, there is no celiac disease that is known in dogs, so dogs do not have a gluten intolerance. Uh, unless maybe you've actually noticed that in your dog, maybe in, you've noticed that your dog does do better on gluten-free food, but there's no scientific evidence that dogs are intolerant to gluten. So just a quick side note there, gluten is totally fine for animals. Um, and same with grain. So dogs, there's a lot of commercials, and you may know what I'm talking about, um, that say, you know, wolves are your dog's ancestors, and so they crave meat, they crave this, they crave that. Um, dogs are actually omnivores, so they need plant proteins and plant carbohydrates, those things, just as much as they need that meat. Um, and so it's very important that they have that balance. So having cornmeal or something like that in that diet is not necessarily a bad thing. As long as your bag has been evaluated by AFCO, it says balanced and complete, uh, and you feel like it's a reputable company, I usually encourage people to um, go with a brand that's known to do research on their foods with dogs, so brands like Hills or Purina, something like that. Um, there's a lot of people that, or a lot of companies that do it. I just, I just encourage people to research that before they buy to make sure that they have educated themselves and that the company they're using is well-educated on the nutrition of animals. Another important note here is that there's also a lot of discussion about byproduct meal mm -hmm. from animal, the animal industry. And I, I mean, I was an animal science major, and so I got to be an ag kid <laughs> in undergrad. But we talk a lot about um, recycling products when we're actually making feeds and meat. Um, so we feed humans first, and then we use the, um, the aftermath of the carcass to help feed animals. Um, and then it seems, it seems a little sad or a little disturbing, but it's really not. These, 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 these foods are, uh, that we're using to help feed dogs and cats are full of protein, and, and the body and the carcasses that we're using, they're clean and, and they're full of protein, and that's what dogs really, really need, um, cats too, and so uh, using a byproduct meal is not necessarily a bad thing. So that's really controversial right now in the, in the news, and I think that uh, understanding what it is and understanding you know how, how it's important not only just to feeding the animal but it's also recycling a lot of these products that we wouldn't be able to use any other way um, and using taking the most from our animals when we do um, when we do slaughter animals we're taking all of their body and we're using all of their body and so it, it, it's economically good and, it, and it's, it helps feed your animals and it's not necessarily a bad thing so and in a sense it would be wasteful not to use those byproducts for something um, would drive your market prices of a lot of different things way, way up. Um, so it's really important to educate yourself on, on the full circle of those issues, um, especially with
grain and and byproducts and things like that. So. But, but there's a lot of companies that does research on on their product, and so we we're not recommending any one. Right, we're not recommending any single product. I do recommend that you use somebody who has done research on their products, um, just because you are more well guaranteed that that is going to be successful for you. Um, we're by no means recommending a specific brand. You mentioned the liver and the pancreas. What do they do and where are they in shorty? <clears throat> so the liver and pancreas, um, those both secrete, well, the liver secretes bile and the pancreas secretes those enzymes that we were talking about, um, like uh, trypsin and, and all of that. So here's the liver in shorty. It's right here above the stomach. Hopefully you can see it. Um, it's this kind of brown grayish mass that's right above the stomach because uh, here's the stomach, remember, that giant hole. Um, the pancreas, I don't know if we can see Shorty's pancreas, but the pancreas usually hangs out in the very, very beginning of uh, the intestines, and it's kind of a, a weird little lobby, lobule type organ um, that secretes those digestive enzymes that we were talking about that um, go into the small intestine. And it also, it also secretes insulin. Right. So that's the source of insulin is the pancreas. Um, and so the liver, its goal is to um, filter the blood that's coming back from the intestines to the heart so that there's no bacteria in it. Um, and to, its other job is to secrete enzymes. So those are the two functions of the liver. And then um, the, the pancreas's goal is to create uh, hormones. It has an endocrine function like insulin and glucagon and things like that. But it also has that enzymatic um, role where it's secreting all these enzymes into the small intestine. Yep. So, so we do have another question. Good. It yeah. is about the parvovirus again. Okay. Um, and vaccinations. So okay. we know that vaccinations create antibodies, and that's how the body fights it off. Mm -hmm. How long do those antibodies stay around and work? And when does the body need to make new ones? This is a wonderful question. Um, I think it's a great question, and it, it's something that people should be asking about all of the vaccinations, not just parvovirus. But um, parvovirus, the vaccination you'll get three boosters. And the goal here is that because a puppy is so young, when you first start giving puppy shots, um, we really don't know if the mother's maternal antibodies are already still present in the animal. And so it would fight off effectively the, vi the vaccination without the puppy actually creating antibodies to it itself. Um, and so we have to give it three boosters as it ages to make sure that at some point it has developed antibodies for this antigen himself. Does that make sense? And so that's why you have to get three booster shots. That's why it's so important to get the three booster shots, is to really ensure that little Fluffy or little Max is completely immune to the virus. Um, and then usually once you have given it for the three booster shots initially, uh, then it's good for about a year. And there's, it's probably good for a lot longer than that. Um, however, the studies we've done have only been for a, long, a year long duration. And so we suggest that just in case, um, you should get your animal vaccinated once a year for uh, rabies and for parvovirus, or the actual, there's a, there's a combo vi vaccination that has parvo and distemper in it, so, as well as a few other diseases. There's also one more question about how safe it is to give them human boots. <laughs> oh, God. You're <laughs> like, <laughs> favorite topics. Don't give your animals human food. Um, they're not... They shouldn't eat that. So, like I said, AFCO evaluates these foods. And if it is complete and balanced, it has everything your dog needs. They have no need to eat your, your human food. Um, it's so tempting, like when you're eating bacon and your dog's sitting there like begging for the yeah. bacon. And you're like, well, this is meat. That could be good. No, don't do it. So, bacon's full of fat. Yeah. It's, your animal can easily become overweight. Um, I think something like, I have a little Yorkie, um, or my mom has this little Yorkie and she's all of like seven pounds and she's considered overweight right now but <laughs> so her daily allowance for calories is like 300 that is not very much you give her that little little piece to you that little piece of bacon and she's halfway there right and so it's really really easy to make your animals overweight by feeding them human food even if it's seemingly healthy um, on top of that feeding them maybe cooked bones is something that a lot of people think of if they're cooked bones um, that's really dangerous for your animals because they start to break down because they've been cooked in their stomach and once they get into the intestines they may break apart and actually puncture through their intestines and create a load of problems that can be very fatal. Um, so it's very important not to feed your animals. Also, people consume a good, good deal of carbohydrates. I mean, we eat 
carbs like the candy, the potatoes and french fries and everything else that all processed food has carbohydrates in it. Um, and so your dog eats a different, a different type of balanced diet. So our balanced diet would consist of quite a few carbohydrates and proteins, um, as well as all the other things we're talking about today. Um, but your dog may have a different ratio, a different percentage that it needs, or your cat even, um, in order to survive and have a healthy life. And so a balanced diet incorporates all of those things, but at what percent? And so when we feed our dogs things that we are eating, um, you're actually feeding it a different ratio than it actually should be having. And so um, carbohydrates is my favorite example. I'm actually gluten uh, sensitive, and so I know how much carbohydrates play a role in all of our processed foods. And when you give them the dog this food, you're actually giving them way too many carbohydrates. And so um, it's, it's a good idea just to just let your dog do, do the feeding and your, your plate not be feeding them anything. Moral of the story, your dog's food has everything it needs. <laughs> your dog does not need anything that you have on your plate. And that's basically it. Unless otherwise prescribed by your veterinarian. Yeah, some veterinarians say. Yeah. Good, a little, little side note there. Yeah. <laughs> So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, again, this is our website, peer.tamu.edu, where you can find um, some of the materials that we talked about today, as well as materials and videos for a wide variety of other topics. Um, we don't just have science topics on here. We actually have quite a few other, if you go to teacher resources and then integrated curriculum, um, there's some English, some math in there as well. Um, <clears throat> but there's videos from world-renowned veterinarians under our videos tab and you can see um, for veterinarians there's a lot of veterinarian videos where you can find uh, kind of how to handle animals things of that nature within the clinic if you want to see some of those things uh, but I think that's just about it so thank you so much for joining us again today and we appreciate your attendance